I'm in the middle of a deserted Second World War airfield in the middle of the English countryside. This is also the magnificent home of the National Collection Centre of the Science Museum. They've been collecting and curating for well over a century and they have some of the world's most important artefacts relating to science, engineering, transport and medicine. And I'm here because amongst that collection are some of the world's most important ship models that tell the story of maritime innovation. We're here to film them using the very latest technology in wonderful studio conditions. So let's see what we're up to. This is the photography studio, it's amazingly equipped. This is where they're photographing everything to get it online. It's an enormous project to get hundreds and hundreds of thousands of the Science Museum's artifacts accessible to everyone all over the world. It's a really brilliant idea, uh, but it also means that we can check out some of the stuff that they're doing. Egyptian bust there. A canoe from the Fiji Islands. Fascinating bit of Pacific maritime history for you there. Presented in 1872. Came to see this earlier wondering why they had a small uh, teddy bear here. It's because in classic science museum style it's a robotic cat. This is the first stage of shooting here. It's quite unique the way the Science Museum do it. They keep their models in these timber cases, protects them from light. They have this plastic sheeting, but they, they're almost like they're gonna come out of cocoons. I love that. Part of the problem with this model of HMS Vanguard is it's so enormously huge. We've got to somehow lift it up so it's at a more workable height. And the only way we can do that is with a forklift truck. It's such an amazing resource this with all of the blackout material enabling us to make these ships almost float but remarkably this isn't the only photography studio they have here there's another one over there let's have a look in here they're continuing their job of cataloguing the incredible collection here making sure that the photographs of them are as good as they possibly can be and they've got all the kit they need to do it let's go and see what they're up to wonderful thing this is a pressure respirator from about the 1850s and it was used to treat people who had trouble breathing it's a kind of a replacement for something called an iron lung which controlled the pressure around the body and it enabled you to breathe so people suffering from things like polio would use something like this lights all the way around got the camera set up here and then we can look over here at the results of what they're doing and with this kind of footage and it allows people to study these objects all over the world in great detail and it'll really help us change the way we think about the past one of the real challenges of photographing an object like this is to make sure every single bit of it is in focus. Now you have a technique called stacking and what they do is they take separate photos of all of the different parts of the object uh, and then they put them all together and that makes sure that every single thing you look at is exactly in focus. It's a remarkable bit of technology. just brought the ambient light down and framed it. Almost looks like this vessel is floating. It's quite extraordinary. 
the two most distinctive design features of Vanguard were at the bow and at the stern. Here you can see the flat transom stern, which was adopted for the very first and only time on a British battleship, and it helped add to the speed of the vessel. Now, what's wonderful about this ship are the beautiful, sweeping, long lines. That's because the, all the British battleships that were built after the First World War were restrained in their size by treaties, Washington in 1922 and London in 1930. And that all went out the window when they built this one. So she was so much longer, so much wider than anything that had been built before. Very stable gun platform and very, very fast. Forty-four and a half thousand tons, 813 feet long, capable of steaming at 35 knots. But the really interesting thing is that she had a range of nine and a half thousand miles, which means that she was able to sail from the UK to Australia without stopping. And that changed the game completely. I'm now going to go and explore what else they've got in this amazing place. These guys are in the middle of a, an amazing logistical challenge. They're trying to move hundreds of thousands of artefacts from their storage facility in London near Earl's Court to here. And they were just telling me they've moved 250,000 of them and unpacked, uh, was it 120,000 was it? 170,000. 170,000 have been unpacked. They're just full of the most wonderful treasures. I love this one. It looks like the um, warship of an evil genius in a cartoon. It's HMS Viking, triple screw turbine destroyer, built in 1910. Fantastic thing. You can just make out in here that there's a Chinese junk here. They have a phenomenal collection of Chinese junks and Asian shipping in general. There's something called the Maze Collection. It was collected in the early 20th century by a guy who was collector of customs in Hong Kong called Sir Frederick Mays, and he saw the Chinese maritime world disappearing in front of his eyes. And what he did was commission a load of model ships made by Chinese shipwrights from Guangzhou and Hong Kong of a variety of different Chinese vessels. And they're a fantastic collection that really tell the story of the different types of vessels that were used in China all up and down the coast. What I particularly love about the Science Museum's collection is that it's not just ship models, they also have models of bits of ships. This one's fantastic, it's something called Harfield Steering Gear, and it shows all the complicated cogs and machinery involved in making the rudder move. This is brilliant. It clearly talks about the scale of the Science Museum collections. These are bikes. I don't know, how many bikes are there? A hundred bikes? More than 200 bikes? I think they've got over 7.3 million objects, all told. We should be able to get a good view from up here of the scale of the place. So many significant objects, treasures of engineering, scientific, medical, transport history, it's all there. I've been excited about filming this model since the project began. This is HMS Prince. She's a first-rate warship 
for the Royal Navy, the English Navy, built in 1670. It's a very, very interesting period. It's just four years after the plague, the fire of London. A year after that, the Dutch raided the Medway, the home of the Royal Navy, and they took away three capital ships, ten ships of the line, and towed away the Royal Charles, the fleet flagship. So this is born of deep rage and a desire to re-establish English sea power as something that was important, something that was going to change the nature of the world. It sings of the splendour and the wealth of England at the time and what their ambitions were. This ship is fascinating because it has a very strong royal connection. It's linked specifically with James, Duke of York. This ship was built during the reign of Charles II. James was his brother, and he was in charge of the entire navy at the time. In fact, James commanded the entire fleet from this ship. It was his flagship during the Battle of Sol Bay in 1672. When Charles later dies, James becomes king, and that leads to the Glorious Revolution of 1688. So it's a fascinating period, and one of the real questions, I think, is how they could afford to build such lavish warships as this, essentially covered in gold. When James was in charge of the Navy during the Second Dutch War, he was also governor of the Royal African Company. One of the first things he did was to direct the Navy to capture Dutch forts off the west coast of Africa, which facilitated English involvement in the slave trade. So slavery is not far behind any of it. Now we're all done. The thing to do is to put the model to bed. We're back off exploring now and um, we're going to go and find a, a couple of fantastic maritime artifacts. This is from uh, the Challenger Expedition of 1872. It was one of the most important scientific expeditions in all of history in helping us to understand the world in which we live. They uh, travelled around the world studying the deep oceans and learning more than anyone ever had done about the marine world. Now, this is another artefact relating to investigating marine life. This is a sounder, more sophisticated version of the lead line. You drop it into the sea and you work out how deep it was. It's a funny looking thing. Oh, this is pretty good. Yeah. And while we're talking about discovery of the world, this is an amazing model. It's a, a recreation of the zoology laboratory that was actually on board Challenger in 1872 when they sailed around the world. I love it. For someone who's constantly losing his keys, this is a slightly ironic collection for me. I've, I've never seen so many keys and so many locks, and I've never really thought about the importance of keys and locks in human history, but there you go. Here, there is a perfectly normal paintbrush. However, there is some reason, currently unknown to me, as to why this has been preserved, but there'll be a very sensible reason that someone will have dedicated resources and space on this shelf for a paintbrush. Love it. Wow, look at that. This part of this enormous storage area is dedicated to microscopes, and once you get your eye in, <laughs> they're everywhere. There are microscopes absolutely everywhere. But it's one of the things I absolutely love about the Science Museum, because they collect things which relate to the most tiniest things on the planet, whether it's atoms or molecules, but also the biggest. They've got stuff here about the exploration of space. I was saying they have artefacts related to some of the biggest questions. This is the biggest of them all. It's a, a flown computer to do with the navigation systems. It's even got the NASA stickers on it. This is definitely somewhere you have to walk around with your elbows in.
just trying to work out where to go next and uh, I've just been told that you can actually carry on filming forever and you don't know when to stop and I think he well might be right. I think we'll have to call it a day at some point. Two ones down. Yeah. This is absolutely fantastic. It's a little diorama. I love dioramas. It's made entirely out of wooden straw. It's a model of Toulon, very important French naval port in the 18th century. And I think it was made by a prisoner of war who had very access to very limited materials, but could clearly get hold of a bit of wood and a bit of straw. I'll tell you what, if I was given some wood and some straw, I wouldn't be able to make this. This brings me back to my childhood. It's a Dalek from Doctor Who, uh, and it's one that someone would get in and move around and pretend to be the Dalek, and um, they had that very distinctive noise. There's actually a bit here, it says, speak here, and it turns your voice into a Dalek. Brilliant stuff. This is a very old fire alarm, and uh, there's a penalty for misuse. You get 25 quid, which is bad enough, but you could also be sent to prison for three months. Oh, it's tough in the old days. We are back in the Science Museum uh, because last time we came here filming there was a power cut, an enormous power cut, and we all had to go home. Everyone in this entire place had to go home. So we've reorganised it, we've come back very excited because we're filming the magnificent Campania. So come and have a look at this. Cunard liner, 1893, one of the very first ships to actually look like a modern steam passenger ship. So previously the other vessels would have an elongated flared bow, they'd have a bowsprit, and before they were rigged as well, so masts and sails, this one doesn't have any masts, doesn't have any sails, it's got these two lovely raked funnels so it gives the impression of speed, these beautiful black and slightly pink hull here, and the very distinctive uh, red funnels with the black bands at the top which really tells us that she was a Cunard liner. Well, you never know what's going to happen when you're filming, and for various logistical reasons, we've had to uh, abandon that studio but come into this one. The Science Museum is so fantastic because they have more than one photography studio. A bit of shimming around, we've had to move this enormous ship model from there into this new location, but there's nothing that we can't cope with. We're going to have to film this one on the floor, though. It's amazing, isn't it? Filming the ship on the floor has posed some challenges, but one of the good things about it is that we get this amazing bird's eye view of this most magnificent model, a real piece of Victorian engineering genius. I love it. Now, it's a very significant ship. It was the first Cunard liner, which had double propellers, twin screws at the back. Uh, it has this flying bridge. This was very common for all passenger liners that followed, a raised area from which they could command the ship and have a much better view of what's coming. It's so important when ships were so much bigger and so much faster. The lifeboats, very impressive. Just about enough lifeboat capacity for around half 
of the people on board. So they had some way to go in terms of safety, but also has a very important position in the history of wireless communication. This was the first ship to exchange a ship to ship wireless signal. This was in 1901 and just a few months after she was the first transatlantic liner to travel all that way across the Atlantic whilst being in permanent contact with shore based radio stations. So after this, never again was a ship isolated in the middle of the Atlantic. We finished filming the Campania, the operation is over. We're now starting to film a really very special ship model. So let's go through and see what we can see. Just take a look at this. So this unbelievable model, one of my favorites, one of the most extraordinary pieces of art that I've ever seen. It was made by an unknown French, probably, prisoner of war kept in a British prison, probably a British prison hulk, an old warship during the Napoleonic Wars. So maybe the early years of the 19th century. These guys were given a certain amount of bone every day. This one has managed to make a warship out of bone. Now some of these prisoner of war models, the riggings made out of human hair or horse hair sometimes. I'm not sure what this one is, but it just talks of the ability to make the most wonderful works of art under the most appalling conditions. It's a model of a French warship, a French first rate, the Ocean, from a class called the Ocean class of ships, larger than Nelson's HMS Victory by some margin, physically longer and also with a much heavier weight of broadside. They really were quite extraordinary ships, these. Some of the largest sailing warships ever built in the age of sail. It's always a bit tricky working with these kind of prisoner of war models because they're not necessarily meant to be faithful representations of ships, but what they are is certainly evocative of the type of ship built at the time, and they're also the most extraordinary physical creations. It makes you wonder just how long this took someone. And I think the answer to that is they had all the time in the world and they were locked up. But we've done two days filming, we've managed four models, and what a place to do it. The Science Museum collections really are the historical home of human ingenuity. It's a magnificent place, this. Mm -hmm.